I'm Colleen Apple. My pronouns are she and her. My heroes have corresponded to the seasons of my life. Currently, I want to put on a red coat and join my hero, Jane Fonda, on Fire Drill Fridays to save the planet. I toyed with the idea of writing a poem titled A History of My Heroes in the same manner that I have written the poem A History of Houses. However, Suzanne asked us to think of that one person, that one hero who had a great impact on us, who turned our intention toward justice and living well. And so I landed on a hero I know personally. My college yearbook. Turn to page 121 and you'll see my second cousin, Penny Bainbridge. I'm on page 127. In 1970, she was a sophomore, and I was a freshman at McPherson College in Central Kansas, operated by the Church of the Brethren, one of the three historic peace churches. Penny's fiancé, a conscientious objector, was killed while working as a medic in the Vietnam War. She is one of the strongest people I have ever met. Because she is so spectacularly reticent about her achievements, I can't tell you many details of her life. We were at the same college and at the same time, giving me the opportunity to get to know her better. But I was the shy 18 year old fresh off the farm and she was the worldly and wise non-traditional student 10 years my senior. My first semester was all about protest and the election, and Penny seemed to be involved in everything related to ending the war. Google Penny and McPherson College, and you'll find a grainy photograph of her at the head of a protest march. I'm pretty sure it was Penny who enlisted me to hand out brochures on street corners in favor of George McGovern, and I marched in that pictured parade. Penny had little tolerance for anything frivolous. She eschewed makeup, Sunday best clothing, and ladylike demeanor. She didn't sit in a chair, she sprawled in one. Her voice was the loudest in the room. She became a social worker and, as a single parent, adopted a boy in his early adolescence. Google her and you'll see her listed as the CEO of the Family Legal Project of Omaha. Faulty memory and hero worship may have prompted me to invent and elevate some of the details of Penny's life. But Penny remains a model for the ways I wish to behave when it comes to social justice work. I want to speak with boldness, brashness, integrity, and passion. I have Penny in mind as I ponder my next chapter in church life. I'm hoping to have the time and energy to focus on social justice and practices of shared leadership. I want to challenge traditional practices and channel Penny's attitude of why not and hell yes. Lately, I have been questioning the ways churches are generally governed with systems rooted in hierarchy, power, and perfectionism. For most of my term as president, I felt that because I was retired and I had the time, I had to be the one who held and disseminated the knowledge. It may have looked like my meticulously organized meeting agenda was an act of caring for very busy board members, but my perfectionism did little to encourage shared knowledge and governance. Back in October and November, we had no nominees for three board positions. So I said there were alternatives to our current board structure that we might consider. I didn't have much to go on at the time, but since the congregational meeting, I have had the opportunity to experience a dynamic governance structure also called a sociocracy for three separate purposes at First UU. The sociocratic structure has been used to think about leadership, the adoption of the eighth principle, and our COVID response. The meetings have resulted in collaborative statements that communicate goals and their impact, and a list of needs that directs next steps. 
The statements from the leadership team and the pandemic task force have been shared with you in What's Up. Today, Suzanne and I use the opportunity of the Martin Luther King Jr. Weekend to share with you our work regarding the adoption of an eighth principle. The group talking about the eighth, prince, eighth principle adoption consented to the following collaborative statement. First UU unknowingly upholds white supremacy culture counter to our message of welcome. We need education and self-reflection regarding the issues we can, can address and the things we can do. Overcoming white supremacy offers First UU more joy and less fear, resulting in a congregation that people will want to be a part of. The following questions and comments came up during our meeting. What impact can First UU have on a societal level? What changes do we need to make within our walls? What do we do first? A change in governance structure is a first step. We are going to be uncomfortable. We may have conflict. We developed the following list of needs with the template. We need blank, so that blank. We need an eighth principal leadership team so that we can start the process. We need information from other UU congregations about how they approach the process of adoption. We need a way to engage the congregation in interrogating white supremacy culture so that we all understand what we're talking about and share a common vocabulary. We need a consciousness that COVID makes us fragile and vulnerable to conflict and discomfort. We need to continually refer to the expected outcome of more joy and less fear. We determined these final three statements as places to begin. One, we need a behavioral covenant to see us through discomfort. Two, we need to address vision, vision and mission first before we begin our educational efforts in full force. Three, we need to involve the Committee on Shared Ministry and Reverend Michelle with the covenant and vision work. What I marvel at about this process is the way we landed at the necessity of crafting a behavioral covenant and a vision statement in a way that did not feel like it had been dictated to us by an organization or a committee or a board president. Increasingly, I have been saying, why not? Why not widen the circle to bring all the church leaders to the table? Why not shorten the bylaws? Why not? And absolutely, yes, let's bend the arc toward justice. I am grateful that I had the opportunity today to share a framework in which that can happen. How marvelous it is that when we're talking about challenging white supremacy, we are also considering a governance structure which offers a real path for dismantling current systems. Let us move forward with intention and optimism. Together, let us bend the arc toward justice.